I think we should start with the fact, Barat, that people have just realised that perhaps there's too much cricket being played. I thought <laughs> it, it's it's very big three nation to suddenly go. Oh, there's no one at one of our games. That means this yeah. format should be that must be in trouble. Completely overlooking the fact that you and I have been to multiple ODI games where like seven people have been in the ground yes. uh, for a very long period of time. And really, outside of a couple of key markets, one day crowds have, haven't been very good in, in a very, yeah. very long time. Yeah, I think it's also worth saying, and you probably know more, the, but it was like a Tuesday. It was cold, dead yes. rubber, um, yeah. out of cricket season. Cricket fans had already spent money going to the World Cup. I think yeah. all that played a part as well. But even so, I, I'm not sure that in the height of summer you're getting more than 20,000 people to that game when it has no context and uh, it just pops up at the end of another series. Yeah, uh, there's no surprises that the best crowd we saw during that ODI series uh, uh, happened in Adelaide, Jared. And, and the only reason for that is it was a lovely day in Adelaide uh, and the members came out in full force. I was very surprised when I... And these days uh, I'm very happy to... Uh, tell let you know that I get a parking pass as well, so I'm, I feel quite special. You know, that's when you know you arrived when you get a parking pass at your home venue. But uh, so as I drove into the parking lot, um, yeah, the grass bank there on the northern side of the Adelaide Oval was packed, and I was like, wow. Like, I my first my gut feeling was maybe there's a wedding going on. There has to be a wedding going on. Clearly, they haven't <laughs> come here for the ODI <laughs> because they have so many venues within the oval premise town or premises there so there are weddings but no a, a lot of members came and uh, the english fans had a, a the best opportunity to be on the grass bank under the historic scorecard and, and make the most of the weather uh, but you, you then think of a venue like the mcg which is not i mean it's a great venue but it, it's not the most family friendly venue is it in that sense like where you can just bring the family out for a whole day uh so that you kind of have uh, your eye on the cricket, but you can do other stuff as well. And also at the Adelaide Oval, because the 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 backside to where the dressing rooms are, as you know, where they have all these uh, activities for members, which is basically where most of the members are during the Adelaide Oval test as well for large periods, uh, drinking a lot of wine, as they should. Uh, that was happening as well. So there was enough to keep everyone excited. So 15,000 plus people at the Adelaide Oval for, a, for that ODI was really impressive. And then, like you said, on a cold afternoon in Melbourne, dead rubber as well. That's really, is it worth spending money on that ticket when you could easily save that money up and uh, buy yourself maybe a Boxing Day ticket uh, or even like, you know, one of those days during the Boxing Day test match if you are living in Melbourne. So I think that had a lot to do with it. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm... Yeah, I, I don't know. People just have become overreactive for everything, haven't they? Like to everything in the world. Like that's just how it is. Like one image of one stand with one fan and that's it. The end of the format, end of the world. But yeah, I think people should just take a, to sound very old school, take a chill pill. It's it's not, nothing is ending. And, and you're right. I mean, one day cricket has, uh, since the growth of T20 cricket, it's, T20 cricket, is it's finally achieved what people wanted to achieve with T20 cricket. Family friendly, three and a half hours. You don't have to spend the whole day. Uh, the kids, you can take the kids home before they start getting cranky. You know more about this than I do. <laughs> and it, it's it's perfect. And then test cricket, especially in a country like Australia, is all about culture and tradition. And, you know, test cricket is part of the summer fabric of Australian society, isn't it? So it makes sense. One day cricket kind of gets left in the... In, in the lurch. And back in the day, one day cricket was always when January, February, uh, mainly. Uh, so school holidays, at least through January, uh, uh, you'd have the kids on holiday. So it made sense to take them there. So yeah, I think, uh, I think someone, someone might listen to this podcast and feel like, uh, I might, I might, Am I sounding like someone who wants to suddenly become a parent, Jared? Or, <laughs> I don't know. I've spoken a lot about kids and parenting in the last five minutes. I just assumed you meant, every time you say that, you're just talking about your dogs. But, uh, which, of course, can't <laughs> annoy us on this podcast because you're in your hotel room in Perth. But That is true. Yeah, I think, <laughs> I, I think from, you know, it's, as you said, there's one photo, I think it was Tim Wigmore's photo that went sort of crazy on Twitter to begin yeah. with, and then there was a bunch of others. And I do understand it, although... 
I would say that the vast majority of the world, 10,000 people at a one day game is still a success. Yeah. I don't think there's, you know, you gotta remember also, I, this always happens with Melbourne. I remember, um, there was, a. I think it was for the fifth day of the 2011 Ashes. There was something like mm. 20 or 25,000 people at the at the last yeah. day. And all the England fans were like, oh, look, the Australians haven't turned up. And it's like, that's a f- full crowd at pretty much <laughs> yes, every ground is. except for Lords, right? And so the exactly. MCG often looks completely empty. Um, and as someone who's spent his whole life watching Sheffield Shield cricket, trust me, <laughs> I'll tell you when it's empty. <laughs> I've got stories about the MCG being empty you guys haven't even heard of yet. So um, I-, I do think that plays a part. The other thing is that, like, this too much cricket thing, it's a- too late now. They've already done the FTP. Right? Yeah, exactly. Cricket boards yeah. aren't al- about to start slashing all these ODI games. In fact, the reason we still have so many ODIs and so many T20 bilateral series is because none of these boards made as much money as they thought they were going to off their franchise yeah. leagues, right? It's so instead of being sensible and going, okay, maybe if we manage the franchise leagues better, we can get more money there. They were like, no, 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 we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll just do both. Yeah, and we'll do as much yeah. as we can of both. And so is it, I think there's less days of cricket, but more games of cricket in the current FTP mm. than the last one. It's like, how are you even fitting all this in? Like, you, you've just done this. And at a certain point, we have, uh, I think, culturally as a cricket uh, collective, and this affects uh, casual fans, even if it takes a lot longer for it to happen. But I think culturally, from almost 2007 onwards, ODI cricket has become the third format. Right. And yes. Yes. I, yeah. I would say the reason that it didn't die off completely is because uh, people still like to go to one day internationals in Australia, England, and South Africa, maybe New Zealand, and get drunk. And in yeah. Asia, <laughs> the 100 ads actually added yeah. up to be worth more than the 40 ads of T20 cricket, even if you had Easy. more people watching in T20 cricket and all those yeah. sorts of things. Right. So, from that perspective, those were the two things keeping it together. What wasn't keeping it together was cricket fans because mm. cricket fans have kind of already made their decision that T20 cricket is a slightly better format and test cricket is the best format. And so one day cricket was always stuck in the middle. And then you have just the ridiculous nature of South Africa playing India five minutes in, in one day cricket, five minutes before a T20 World Cup. And then yeah. Australia playing England five minutes after England have won a T20 World Cup in one day <laughs> cricket. Yeah, exactly. Even if, yeah. if there wasn't too much cricket, that would be a problem. Yeah. And, and just look at the schedule for um, Australia next year. They go and play four test matches in India, stay back to play three ODIs, then Ashes, uh, maybe a World Test Championship final. Then they go back to India to play three more ODIs and then the 50-over World Cup. Uh, I mean, it's it's bizarre when you look at it. Um, and now that the ODI Super League at, uh, post-2023 has, uh, has been dissolved, uh, it's it's up to countries to just you know come up with their own bilateral ODI series, if I'm not mistaken, right? So which I think we're going to see more of this. And, and look, ODI cricket in India still will get crowds. I mean, that's just the nature of well, there are just enough mm. Indians to fill up any cricket ground anywhere in the world, but especially in India. I mean, all those six ODIs. I mean, nobody's going to talk about overkill at that point. We are not going to have a, uh, a any of those ODIs wherever they get played. Uh, where the, the the organizers will struggle to sell tickets, but that's just the nature of uh, how cricket gets consumed in India and and large parts of the subcontinent. I mean, even the ODIs that Australia played against Pakistan after the Test series, even though the the fizz was gone because it was so there was so much hype around the Test series, it was still a full house. I mean, the ODIs that Australia played in Sri Lanka, uh, despite the economic crisis and all of that full house so it's 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 different i mean in the subcontinent and and, and you're right i mean you, it's important to put it into perspective uh the time of the year and uh you know the size of the stadium like you said uh 10,000 20,000 15,000 in at trent bridge is a full house right uh so i i, I, I don't think one day cricket is going to die ever right I, I i'm sure you agree with me jared it's 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 still a very at very, the very least uh, i don't think the world cup would no <laughs> Oh, no, no chance. And even bilateral one-day cricket, uh, yeah. maybe it'll just be the no, big you... teams or whatever, whatever you want to call them. They'll play each other. Well, I, or... I think um, my guess is going forward, I suppose this depends on the financials and how many players you can get available. But 
before World Cups, teams are going to have to play bilaterals as friendlies to, yeah. to warm up for those tournaments. What will probably what should happen is that you know you shouldn't be playing one day as now, or we shouldn't be playing one day as before the T Twenty World Cup, and vice versa, because no. that doesn't make yeah. any sense. But that was also because they had the Super League, which is a, a great idea in principle. But yes. being that they gave it up straight away doesn't mean anything. So yeah, I I'm with you. I mean. Maybe one day we'll get to the point where we don't need a T20 World Cup and a one-day World Cup, which is possible. Mm. But it, regardless, uh, other than that, I would say one-day cricket would remain. But bilaterally, I can't see how it's going to have a cultural relevance within cricket. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, I mean, the, the what again, how do you fit it in? I was thinking about it the other day. The one way it can stay relevant going into the future is you almost have like a a two month period if they can find it before a 50 over world cup like before every 50 over world cup and because it's once every four years i still think they can do it where everyone just plays a lot of one day cricket almost to tune up for that world cup so it's almost like you create yeah. that interest around that format for that two three month period uh or two three i would say two and a half three and a half month period where one and a half months is the world cup and the two months prior to it kind of lead up to it but there you go icc that that's an idea for you that you've uh, uh another idea that jared and bharat have given you so maybe you can work on it but that's that's one way i can see some relevance coming back to bilateral odis but otherwise like you said now with the super league gone as well yeah it's going to struggle so while we're talking about one day cricket, should we talk about Martin Guptill, who I believe is around the 39th or 40th highest scorer in one day international cricket history? Uh, I'm just trying to look at my stats. I'm not sure. <laughs> He's high. He's made over 7,000 ODI runs. So yes. he announced this week that he wasn't retiring from uh, international cricket, but that he wasn't going to take a contract, which is basically mm. what Trent Bolt said. The only yeah. difference was that Trent Bolt was very much in demand and, and Martin Gupta was probably more of a fringe player at this stage yes. in that. Um, again, th this is different than Bolt's, I think, in some ways, because what you have is a situation with a player who is probably more like Mar um, uh, like um, uh, Mitchell McLennigan, where he's he's going... I could keep playing international cricket, but if I just played league cricket, I'll probably make slightly more money. Yeah. Right? Or a lot more money, hopefully, but at the very least, more money. Whereas Trent Bolts was a little bit more like, well, I can just have one contract with one um, new board now, mm. which will be Mumbai, and um, yeah. and I'll be looked after for the next few years. Right. So it's slightly different, but all, all from the same family. Um, what is it, How many more are we going to see, I suppose, is the next question of... How many other mm. players are we going to see who just be like, we don't need central contracts? So one of the big things, I'm sure you've talked to players about this before, uh, and I talked about uh, Michelle about this um, on, a, on another podcast recently, but um, one of the big things is insurance, right? Mm. If these players could start to get the sort of money where they can cover their own insurance, or yeah. um, in Trent Bolt's case, I would assume, I would assume Mumbai will cover his um, insurance they're... for his body yeah. and everything else, that... Um, at a certain point, I don't know what the national contract is going to offer those players, and they can still play for the national team. It's just that yeah. uh, they can prioritize franchise cricket. Oh, that's that was always expected to be the way forward, wasn't it, Jared? I mean, uh, we saw the writing on the wall at least a few years ago. Uh, just the way uh, league cricket around the world was uh, was spreading, growing, mushrooming all at the same time. Uh, and, and yeah, you're right, Trent Bolt. Very different to Martin Guptill. I saw Martin Guptill throughout the World Cup um, in the nets, just helping out his other teammates. And you, uh, I, I don't know Martin Guptill at all, but just looking at him, you, you, I, I got a very resigned vibe from him. That like you know, mm, well, I, this can't last for too long. And now with Finn Allen having come through and New Zealand really investing a lot in him, and so they should. Uh, it only makes sense for if if you are Martin Guptill to see what's out there, like to go. Uh, shopping as uh jason holder told me and we'll talk about him soon uh once you hit hit a certain stage in your career and in, in the modern era you can go shopping and especially if you are a martin guptill who's got a proven reputation maybe not in the ipl ipl for some reason has never clicked for martin guptill he's one of those right aaron finch martin guptill maybe aaron finch is at least captained ipl sides but martin guptill i think aaron finch had some gr good years I don't know if Martin yes. Guptill ever had like ever, an no. above par IPL year, did he? Never, never. And like a few times, at least twice, I remember he was a replacement player. So 
all the more pressure on him to like get he he would get two or three games where he had to perform and he couldn't. A couple of times he went for decent money. I think he was with Mumbai at one point, if memory serves me right. But it never has worked. It never worked out for him. But I mean, look, IPL is not the be all end all uh, in today's world. So there's so much uh, other cricket happening. Uh, like we discussed last time. T10 tournaments and all sorts of tournaments popping up all around the world. So, uh, it only makes sense for him to go shopping around. Um, How many more will we see? Many, many more, I think, especially from countries like New Zealand and, uh, I mean, West Indies sort of, like with everything else, right? They, They got the test format before anyone else. They got T20 cricket before anyone else. They got ODI cricket before anyone else. And in a way, now when you look back at it, uh, the likes of Bravo, Polar and Gale also got where world cricket was going before anyone else, right? Like, I mean, they, uh, the stance they took by trying to get their cricket board to add clauses to their contracts, which would allow them to freelance whenever they wanted to, is what is happening 10, 12 years later. So I think they, they, sh- they should be looked at as pioneers. Like, you know, they started off as being looked at as renegades and rebels, but they were pioneers and that's what's happening um, Sri Lanka could be another team that goes down that road uh, if there are good enough white ball players coming through the ranks. Uh, uh, did you see? I saw three of them got married together. That's pretty sweet, by the way, overnight. I think uh, Kasun, Rajita, Asalanka and Nisanka got married at the same time. It was, and they all danced together. It was quite something, yeah. Now, speak of team bonding. Now, that's, that, that should be number one. Like <laughs> Number one activity. Get married if you want team bonding. But... Uh, I think it's it's just we're just gonna hear more and more of this, and I really do think someday Jared, you and I should just sit and do a long podcast on the importance of insurance. I've spoken so much about insurance in the past. The biggest difference, especially for fast bowlers from the seventies and eighties to now, the big game changer is insurance, right? I mean, I've always thought about. I put myself in a fast bowler's head in the seventies and eighties, especially later in the day when you have to come in for the last spell. I'm sure at some point they were wondering, even though in the heat of the moment, maybe you don't think about these things. Like, if I bowl the two extra overs and I break down, that's it for me. I'll have to cover my own, you know, recovery, uh, operation, surgery, whatever. And then insurance comes into the picture where a national cricket board takes care of your injuries and your body. And it's a game changer, right? I'll give you the two extra overs because I know I'll be taken care of. So central contracts really changed everything, but so did insurance. And and uh, and it's not just insurance, right? The the access to world class physios, like so, if you are signed up for the Mumbai Indians, um, and you are an even, uh, it's happened in the past in Indian cricket. An Indian cricketer gets injured during the IPL. And there are some Indian cricketers who prefer going to their IPL physios and not the Indian cricket physio or the physios at the National Cricket Academy. And that clash happened, I remember, at least seven, eight years ago. But now it's, I've heard from high-profile physiotherapists who work with high-profile international teams who say that, yeah, I get, we get sly messages from some high-profile players saying, um, okay, we'll just keep it hush-hush. We'll just meet in a foreign country where you can treat me because I trust you more than the physio we have right now in the in the national team. So uh, that makes a huge difference as well, right? If you are trend bowl, like you said, you, everything gets taken mm-hmm. care of for you by uh, the Mumbai Indians or whoever you signed up to. I, I mean, I hate to make this all about the insurance. As you said, you and I could probably do the whole episode, but that first West Indian strike partly came on the back of the fact that uh, um, uh, Dwayne Bravo, was his physio bills weren't going to be paid. Um, not to mention that uh, part of the reason that Nicholas Puran hasn't played any first-class cricket is because uh, Trinidad uh, stopped paying his rehab bills. Um, so I mean, these things are really, really interesting. And I think it's the reason we haven't had, not insurance on its own, although I do think insurance is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, but I think it's the reason that we haven't had bigger um, freelance cricketers. So if you look at it, mm. I would actually say we've had desperately few freelance cricketers yes obviously had you know the west indians you know there was early pioneers like probably someone like Dirk nanis obviously mitchell mcclenaghan yeah. uh, was someone who did it afterwards we've had a few but the reason is that if you're if you're a young player coming well if you're a player coming through by the time you're at that point you would have been groomed by a national board and yeah. that would have been your safety blanket and so for yes. a lot of those players of an older age, they just felt like they needed to keep that safety blanket. Whereas I think now what we're seeing is players are like, I don't need to do that. And if we get mm. to the point where the Mumbai owners own 
the hundred, which is possible. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, Major League Cricket, South Africa, UAE, um, obviously, and the IPL. Like, and and the Royals are doing the same thing, and and you know, the Kings are doing the same thing, and you know, all these different teams are doing that. Yeah. I do think at that point the players are going to feel even more comfortable uh, to yeah. to leave national national boards. Um, but I do think I actually think the the progression of it has probably been slower than I would have thought in in two thousand eight two thousand nine. I would have thought by this point, you know, a good percentage of cricketers would be freelance. And I think if you actually, I remember talking to Tamal Mills and thinking he was freelance, and he's like, no. And I think, yeah. and, and I said, I don't think there's that many freelance cricketers in the world. It's just not something that we discuss yeah. that much. Uh, certainly not that many outside of the West Indies. All right, let's take a break there. And then after the break, uh, let us talk about Jason Holder. You're listening to Cricket's Conversation on 99.94. Whatever your team, we have the show for you on podcast, YouTube, or on the 99.94 app. We have India, England, South Africa, West Indies, and now Sri Lanka covered. If you want to find us, the best way is to follow us on social media at 9994DM by downloading the 9994 app or Google 99.94 on podcast. We speak cricket. You're back with Jared Kimber and Barrett Sundarason. And uh, you you caught up with Jason Holder, who uh, apparently you two had like a 10-year reunion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it sounds, it sounds kind of weird, but he has been on. I remember the first time I met him was at the Champions Trophy in, oh, it must have been 2013. So what, 11 mm. years back. Yeah. And I remember that Alison Mitchell and... Um, Oh God, I've forgotten the name. Who's the um the media uh, spoons? Philip Spooner from the West yeah. Indies. I remember them taking me aside and like, you've got to interview this guy. He's so good. And I'm like, well, he's not even gonna play. Like, yeah. you know, at that stage, I think he was on Chennai's books that he hadn't really played. And um, I couldn't see how he was gonna play. And then you and he was at a press conference and afterwards, and I was like, Oh, I get it now. That's why. Yeah. Cause he does talk uh in a way that not that many cricketers do. Uh yes. 10 years on, uh views and recollections, and did you hug each other? <laughs> no, he was very sweaty. It was uh, after a training session in Perth, and I did like yeah, we've you know we've been um, we've known each other long, or uh, we've known each other long enough for uh, me to know. I don't, I didn't need to hug him to you know uh, to complete the reunion uh, at all. So no, no, I, I saw him for the first time, and it's funny he didn't recall this incident. Uh, I saw him for the first time. I didn't meet him in 2011 when I was in the West Indies. They had this Legends of Barbados uh, event. Uh, this is when the late uh, Seymour Nurse um, was was the chief guest. And I think you had the great, late, great Tony Cozier hosting the event. And Carl Hooper was, uh, at that point, in charge of the academy team, the West Indies Cricket Academy team. And now he's doing commentary for uh, this West Indies series. Uh, and the three of them were on the podium. And it was, it was a fun event. Like, they spoke about the history of Barbados and what it meant to West Indian cricket. And um, once that finished... Uh, there was the Q and A session, and I hadn't I hadn't noticed that right behind where I was sitting with the uh, then West Indies under nineteen team. And as soon as they like opened the floor up for questions, the one really long hand went up right behind me, and I turned around and there was this giant, or not a giant of a man, but this monster. I mean, this uh, tall, like he was as lanky as he is now. I think he's put on some muscle now, Jason Holder. But back he's then, a little it was bit like stronger, tall, but he's still quite lanky. He's still quite lanky, but back then it was just like this thin, long tree, uh, like a palm tree <laughs> behind me. So he just got up and his question was about legacy and leadership. And I was like, wow, impressive. And even the guys, I mean, Seymour Nurse and all were really impressed with this young man. And they were happy that he's West Indies under-19 captain and also from Barbados. Um, and it always stuck with me. And then I think I interviewed him a year later. And this was purely about his uh, cameo appearance in Fire in Babylon. Uh, uh, where he is in the opening scenes, you know, you have all these young guys um, like running in. They'll show like this young guy running in, and then kind of cut to Ian Bishop or Bertley Ambrose or someone. So Jason Holder is one of the uh, opening cred opening scenes with his uh, shirt off and just looking very menacing. Uh, and that was the interview. And ever since, obviously, he's gone through a lot of ups and downs in his career, and 
uh we we've, we've always kept in touch but we I, i wouldn't call him a close friend or anything but we always kept in touch we've had that professional relationship so it was good to like kind of uh me i bumped into him in salamanca actually before the world cup began and he was uh, uh yeah the first thing he said was man nothing's changed about you you still walk around dressed in your pjs as it yeah that's true yeah <laughs> so uh it was late at night but then we did promise that that or we did decide that day that we'll do an interview so it happened yesterday and it was interesting listening to him i mean just and my first question to him jared in the interview and it it hasn't come out yet it will come out sometime to, later today or tomorrow was why do you even care about west indies cricket anymore right like everything that has happened in your life and how you've been treated and how the ups and downs and the good and bad all of it but why do you even care about it and he kind of took a couple of seconds to reflect on it and he said like i don't know man like every time i feel like i don't care something happens and i'm kind of you know it it's uh i i i can't slide back into you know wanting to play for west indies and caring about the pride and the legacy of west indian cricket uh and there are some really interesting things he said which uh i won't give away uh, just because of pure respect to crick buzz uh, uh you know the interview which should be out later today but just about having visions like you know every time apparently a couple of times in the last four or five years he's had moments where he's felt like let me just give it up you know like just let me go shopping around for other options but then apparently he gets this these visions where he's you know raising his bat as a west indian cricketer or celebrating a wicket as a west indian cricketer and it pulls him right back and a couple of times those visions have played out in real life which is kind of quite interesting actually listening to him and you could see he he was quite um i wouldn't say emotional but he was really intense about how much not just um him his contribution to west indies cricket but how west indian cricket is portrayed around the world and how much it matters to him like which was quite encouraging to listen to you know like from someone who has been there and, and he's not like nicolas puran who's been around a while i know he was captain and all that but jason holder has and like he said like he said when i was growing up all we could do was play for west indies right we didn't have all these other options so that's so deeply ingrained in 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 his system as well so to hear someone like that at 30 talk about how much it still means to him uh, as a true west indian fan like myself i felt like you know i felt good i felt good about life yesterday when i the interview finished and i walked back home yeah i think it's an interesting one as well because he's improved a lot as a t20 player yes but he's all he's definitely not an automatic ipl level player mm. right you have to fit him into the right team still a bit awkward where he bowls his batting is probably i think his batting is probably underused in t20 cricket realistically he should yeah. probably just bat it you know number 4 or 5 and use the long levers against the spin they quite often use him at the end which i don't think he's that uh you know uh suited to he bowls a lot at the death but i think he goes at almost 11 runs and over but he takes wickets like every mm. four balls or some ridiculous strike rate when he bowls at the death so it's kind of not a good death bowler but he's still not a terrible one i i wonder what it would be like if he was 10% better as a t20 player uh because he mm. look i you know him better than i do but i've interviewed him a lot over the years and i would say that i don't have as good a relationship as, as you do with him. <laughs> i think he views i think he views me as an annoyance i think i've just been at a lot of West Indies losses um yeah, you know but probably that, being that, that matters, and you yeah. know you know what it's like they don't actually have many big press conferences outside of ICC events no so no you know they go to those events and you know what you and I are like you know it's uh, so when the 34th over Jason you and he's just like <laughs> what shut up and they're yeah, not used exactly. to that sort of stuff that's not how the West Indies media really questions yes, them West Indies yes. media is like you know why did you not play better and we're sitting there yeah, going true. strategically was that the right idea yeah um, true true <laughs> he's an incredibly political person uh mm. and i i he's in, very very polished um and everything else but i do wonder if he was just 10% better at t20 cricket whether he would be as passionate about the, and that's not having a go at him right like no 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 at a certain point it's it, it it's just a reality of you know i mean 
we all sit there and go, oh, Craig Brathwaite's such a test purist. But Craig Brathwaite's sitting there <laughs> going, oh, I'd love True. to get that IPL money, <laughs> right? There, There is oh. a thing that's out there. So, I, I, I mean, it's great that he says the right things, but I just think there's a certain point where maybe that's, I don't want to say his level, but he's a fringe top-level T20 player compared to Pollard and Narayan and Russell and those sorts of guys. No, no, I, I, I'm sure that has something to do with it as well. Uh, but I guess the on, only thing I would say is, he's, like you said, he has really improved his T20 cricket in the last two, three years. So, and, and he did say this as part of this interview, and I've heard him say, talk about this in the past as well, where he, uh, at 30, he's very happy, you know, fighting for the legacy of West Indian cricket. I don't know, at 32, 33, if, if he'll be doing the same. And, you know, this also gives him time to uh, work even more on his T20 skills and, and possibly, like, you know, elongate his freelance career whenever that comes. I'm sure it's going to come, right? And he spoke about uh, the, that term he was shopping around at some point, I'm sure. And I th I've read an interview of his from last year where he said that I could have made a lot more money if I had gone that route earlier, which... Who knows? Maybe it's true. Right? I mean, maybe if you do go the freelance route, you get more time to work on your skills. And uh, and the more you play in all these other leagues as well, maybe you just get better at, at that format. So it, it's, it's, it's... There's no doubt. Yeah, I, you can look I, at it. I looked at his record. He His record got a lot better when he started playing more. So I do think that... Yes. I, I think he has improved. Yeah. I just don't think he has the high ceiling um, that some of the other players do. Oh, yeah. I mean, especially with... Uh, yeah, and you know it's a uh, he's been running in and bowling lots of overs in Test cricket and other formats for for over ten years now. So I'm sure that will catch up at some point as well, unless he can somehow transform himself into this power hitter, uh, which is not his game. He's actually a classical Test batter if you look at him. He's beautiful batter to watch, but uh, and I'm sure he's going to enjoy these Australian wickets, but. Uh, if he can do that, maybe spend the next couple of years just working on his power hitting. Maybe, you know, uh, he's he's a good guy to have around the camp. He's calm and he's relaxed and he brings that uh, calmness to the setting. And and he's been, a, I mean, let's face it, he's been a captain at international level for, or he was for six years, seven years during some really uh, interesting times in West Indian cricket. So he, he does have that extra value add to him as just to have him around the dressing room uh but yeah it'll be interesting to see how his uh, career goes uh and i don't know whether we'll see another jason holder like cricketer play this long for west indies and by jason holder like cricketer i mean someone who's an all-rounder who can do both right if if say you are a young um 21 year old coming through the ranks so and you're not craig brathwaite but you're like more like jason holder I'm sure you're looking at the modern world and you're thinking, wow, if I work on either one of my skills a little more, I could be the next Andre Russell. Like, you know, do you want to be the next Andre Russell or do you want to be the next Jason Holder? I mean, I'm sure uh, there'll be young kids in the Caribbean who, who might want to be either. But uh, that's the question, I think, uh, that uh, is being asked right now in at the junior level. And one thing he did say was like, um, I did ask him at some point, I said, like, does the West Indian concept still work for you? I mean, I said, you were born in independent Barbados, right? Um, so I remember the late Tony Kozia telling me about how that is a bigger challenge than this whole urban legend of people just going and playing basketball, which is not, I don't think that's, there is some truth to it, but I don't not think true. that's the ultimate it's truth. It's not true. Yeah. I've done the numbers. It is not exactly. true. It's not, it, it like, is I, not true. I promise you it's, it's just not true. It, yeah. Sorry. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah I've done I mean, that narrative. And yeah, and Tony goes here to get really annoyed with it, that narrative as well. And But he, he always felt that it's a question of all these, yeah, the, and this is when, back in ten, back 10 years ago uh, when he used to say this to me. So, uh, will these kids who are born in like these independent nations want to be part of this collective, which um, is not doing too well. I think that was uh, and that was my question to Jason, and he felt like he's met like a few young cricketers in the CPL, uh, some young 18, 19 year olds who are still striving to play for the West Indies at this point, and he felt that that's a good sign. But we'll see how it goes. Like you know, it's uh, West Indian cricket is always uh, interesting that way. It, it it always sways from one side to the other. Yeah, I mean, I've, I find it quite interesting. I've just done a whole episode with Michelle on this and we sort of attacked on the other end. 
if you are a young West Indian cricketer from whichever country you're from, right? Yeah. If you're, if it doesn't mean anything to you, and so because it doesn't mean anything to you in your generation, it dissolves. West Indian cricket becomes really irrelevant really quickly. And you yep. could argue that it's already on its way to irrelevance, that one day side is terrible. Their T20 side yeah. <laughs> doesn't look much better. Their test side has done yeah. okay, but the guy who got them there as coach is now left. So who knows if yes. they'll be able to keep that that sort of patchy form going. Um, but yeah, it's it really is. And if you're from Trinidad, Barbados, Guyana, Jamaica, you should be one way or another between the best... 10 and 20 teams mm. in the world and most of the formats, right? But those teams don't get a lot of airtime. But if you're from mm. any of the other islands, like that's it. Uh, that's it. Those are, they're never going to have huge moments no. in cricket again. The whole thing's really interesting from that perspective. It's also a really hard thing to split up because you basically, all of those boards, well, the all the independent boards would have to give back the ICC money. If they split up. Yeah. So from a political and a financial point of view, good luck getting people to give back money or, or, or mm -hmm. say no to, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. over the next few years. So it is, it is really weird. Uh, let's leave it there, mate. And uh, uh, we'll have one more break. And then after the break, uh, I want to talk to you about, uh, uh, I was going to say six sixes in an over, but it was seven sixes in an over. Wasn't it? <laughs> if you love the language of cricket and want more, and head over to the 99.94 app and you can hear all of our podcasts and cricket commentary. We're adding new shows all the time and covering cricket series from all over the world. Be the first to hear all of our announcements by following us on social media at 99.94 DM. Welcome to Cricket's Conversation. All right, you're listening to Uncovered, Jared Kimber and Bharat Sundarisan. Uh, Rusraj Gaikwad uh, hit seven sixes in an over. And uh, I don't even know the name of the bowler because I didn't look him up because I, I don't want to remember his name because <laughs> no one wants to be remembered for this sort of thing. Uh, but what a, a, for those who didn't see, absolutely magnificent that a left arm finger spinner uh, managed to bowl a no ball in the middle of an over uh, where he was getting smashed everywhere. The other thing I noticed about the over was that he um he really didn't change his length or lines exactly. all that much. <laughs> <laughs> he, yeah. He no. just assumed that eventually uh Guy Quad was gonna miss hit one. I get it. I just think I would have tried a few more things. And we, you know, we've seen some of the other there was there was also I don't reckon he bowled one of you know, like 110k an hour ball or anything. He just no, really no. rolled through that over hoping something would come right. Um uh, What's the most runs you've ever gone for in an over? Oh, I have gone, I, I have bowled a couple of overs which went for like 22, 23. I remember it, it happened in one season where uh, uh, both times, there were quite a few wides involved as well. Like, you know, with my bowling action, if I was off rhythm, uh, like see. the great Mitchell Johnson once said, uh, agreed with me. Is that this Apart from doing our podcast together, we also... Uh, bowl left arm. Um, he's left arm fast and left arm, I would say, he'll stop at that. Uh, but I once showed him a clip of my action and he was like, what is that? I said, look, when I got it right, I was unplayable. When I didn't, I went all over the shop. He was like, man, that's the story of my life. So I think that's also a reason where we bonded over our bowling actions. But um, yeah, I remember and it's at whatever level you're playing, you bowl some overs where you know, right, after the second ball, oh, I just want to finish this over, man. Like, this is not going, this is not going right. Like, yeah, and you just want it to end. Uh, and I'm sure it happens at every level, whether you're playing under eights or if you're playing test cricket or first class cricket or list day cricket. Like, uh, I think Shiva Singh is the name of the bowler, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he will go down. That, and, I, uh, I, I did look it up briefly, but I it's already gone for me. I, usually yeah. I focus more on the bowlers of those overs just because... Yeah, I mean, like Tilak Raj, if, when, uh, yeah, it is... Yeah, oh... Indian Express says Shiva Singh, the yep. 360 degree bowler. <laughs> so, well, I don't know what a 360 degree bowler is. I'll have to read up about Shiva Singh, but uh, I've never heard of a 360 degree bowler before. But so, um, yeah, I mean, he'll go down in 
uh, alongside the likes of Malcolm Nash and Tilak Raj. Not so much Stuart Broad, uh, I guess, just because, you know, it was Stuart Broad. Um, and what about the Dutch bowler who conceded 6 6 to Herschel Gibbs? Uh, I, I don't remember his name. Yeah. Is that a leg spinner? Leg spinner Wan Dun. Ooh, I think it was no, B U N G Wan Bang. So yeah. I went so, but, for. I went for 34 runs in and over. Wow. And okay. the first, first five balls went for six. Oh. And I still, to this day, think the guy I was bowling to, out of pity, chipped the last ball. I think he'd hit six sixes oh. in and over before. Uh, before. And he was, no, no, he was no, no, no. way better cricketer than me. He was, a, he was a semi-professional cricketer, and I was about 15 or 16 at the time. And I think off the last ball of the over, he just chipped one away. And even then, <laughs> it went about five metres from going for a six. But he certainly could have done it. And I just remember the helplessness of, yes. of what I could do, especially as a wrist spinner. Like, I can't bounce him, right? Yeah. And I tried leg spin, and I tried wrong ends. I tried quicker ones, and I tried wide, and it just it didn't matter. But I actually hit six sixes in an over. And, oh, uh, really? I was playing a tournament and this poor part-time off spinner came on and I bludgeoned him for six sixes. And when we all went back to the change rooms afterwards, when the tournament had finished and every person who came through just ripped him and he quit cricket about a year and a half after that. And I'm not saying oh, it was dear. because of that, but in that yeah, year yeah, and yeah. a half, it, it was mentioned so often and almost from the first time people, like, when I was out there, I remember the wicket keeper was saying to me, you can't stuff this up. You have to <laughs> do this. And I remember the last yeah. ball, it was just, like, I'd hit some nice shots, but the last ball was just an utter slog because I just had to swing as hard as I could, right? Yeah. And, and everyone went crazy. And the minute we got off the field, I felt so bad for this guy. Um, <laughs> and, and, like, we were linked as, like, uh, uh, from then on in. Uh, yeah, and so I've always always thought more of the uh, of the bowlers than I have of the batters in that situation. But I mean, Guy Quad, I had a look. He's got a I know uh, only person in the world who's going to say this. He's got a really good boundary ratio. Um, he's got he actually. <laughs> yes. You look at his profile. His yeah, profile's yeah. a little bit more like a West Indian player than like a, a standard Indian player. There's actually a lot of those guys now. I don't. You remember we we had the India con conversation last week, and I've been going through a lot of the players in India. Mm. It's remarkable how many players they now produce who don't rotate the strike very well, but hit boundaries, yeah. but don't hit them quick enough to actually score at a really good rate. So Prisvi Shaw is the guy who does that. And yeah. the rest of them are a little bit more stuck in the, this sort of anchor position. But Guy Quad was certainly someone who came up on my ratio of hitting um, uh, good balls. But uh, yeah, um, it just sucks. Uh, at least in yours, you bowled some wides. And for those who haven't yeah, yeah. ever seen Barat bowl, it is worth <laughs> trying to track down any foot footage of Barat bowling because the combination of his action and his hair it's just an absolute <laughs> sight for anyone. And I remember the first time, I think we were at the Oval. Yeah. So any yeah. cricket ground I go to, when they have press conferences in the, in the nets, I always go rooting around for a ball just so that, yeah, you know, because yeah, yeah. we've got nothing else to do. And I remember <laughs> the ball being thrown to you and just being like, well, this is, this is <laughs> absolute. This, this, this bowling actually brings me nothing but joy. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, it did, it did bring me a lot of joy, but there were those... Days where, like, yeah, and, and you know, when you are going through that over, you know when uh, it's really bad and it's really hopeless when, uh, it, when when the ball comes back to you, whether it's the captain or whoever's at mid off or mid on, just throws you the ball and doesn't even look at you. It's like no, because the, when you start an expensive over after whatever stage of the match, after the second ball, even if you've gone for eight runs or 12 runs, there'll be some encouragement. They'll be like, it's all right, man. It's all right, whatever. Chalega, yaar, chalega, whatever. But after like balls three and four, there's nothing from, like, you know, the ball goes through it either. You lose even the if room. You just yeah, you lose the room and you just know that it's you. It's you. Uh, the And it's not even like the focus is on you. Like people just want this to end. Like not for your sake, but for their sake. Like, you're the villain of the piece here. So it's not a nice feeling at all. So uh, I do feel for uh, Shiva Singh. But man, I, I've been fortunate to see a bit of Ruturaj Gaikwad in the IPLs, really, in the last couple of years because I've done some watch-along stuff. Uh, and, and there is something 
you're right. I mean, he's such a serial boundary hitter. Hits a lot of sixes as well uh, at the top of the order for for Chennai. And, and one of those guys, I've seen him hit boundaries of everyone, right? Like, you know, there are some domestic cricketers from India who will come through the ranks and uh, they'll hit hit the other fellow domestic bowlers or even like a couple of international bowlers as well. But then they'll come up against a, a Rabada or back in the day, Dale Stain. And suddenly you'd be they, they'd get found out. But not this guy. I've seen him like do it to everyone. And he's played, I think, a handful of international games. But yeah, he could... I mean, there are so many who... You know, you look at the Ryan Parag, who comes in for a lot of criticism, is another one of those. He's hit what three or four hundreds in the Vijay Azare Trophy, uh, and and the one good thing that has happened in Indian cricket, and I think global cricket, Jared, is this whole uh, uh, all these domestic games being uh, digitally streamed. So you're not just hearing about them. Like now, you can actually watch these guys and do see what. What real they are made of? I mean, I'm sure there are IPL scouts all around the country doing that as well. But even for people like you and me who are in the in the profession of writing about them and kind of figuring out why they are scoring so many runs, we can see them do that. I think that really is that's just been a big game changer. No, I mean I absolutely love it. I mean I remember doing stats um, on I must have been looking up New Zealand cricket and Kyle Jameson's name came up and I'd never seen him. And you can literally Google, you know, and this is like 2017, 2018, Glenn Phillips and Kyle Jamieson. And there's just mm. bunches of New Zealand clips of A games and domestic games. And I don't think people actually realize how much good cricket footage is out there. Like, it, you know, Mohammed Wazim comes in and you hear the commentators say things like, well, you know, I don't know much about him. It doesn't actually take that long to look up the clips and get a good idea of who these players are. Um, so if you are a keen cricket fan and you hear a name, you can, you know, you definitely find them uh, quite soon after that. Anyway, mate, I will let you get down. I was going to say to the Wacker, but I'm assuming it's per stadium these days. Um, and uh, I will go to bed, but I'll talk to you again next week. <laughs> yes, you will. Uh, no, yeah, I mean, they, they do. It's strange, though. They train at the Wacker two, three days leading into the test. But the day before the test, they always go to the Optus. It's, it's kind of weird how that works out. Now you can't get away from those magical whacker nets. <laughs> exactly. Mm-hmm.